Julius Caesar was an important figure in the history of Rome because he helped to bring about the end of the Roman Republic. For 450 years, Rome had not been ruled by a single person, but instead had elected officials, a senate, a system of checks and balances, and a political system that kept one person from having all the power. Julius Caesar was a successful general who conquered territories outside of Rome and helped turn Rome into a large empire. He became such a powerful figure that after defeating his political rivals, he took on the role of dictator, so that he picked all the candidates for the Senate and decided personally which laws would be passed. He didn't have a title such as king or emperor, and Rome was technically still a republic, but it wasn't working like one anymore. It had become a permanent dictatorship. Julius Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC. He was stabbed by a group of senators as he was on his way to the Senate. The assassins said they were killing him to bring back the Republic. Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, isn't about Julius Caesar the character so much as it is about the assassination and what happened afterward. The two people responsible for the assassination are Cassius and Brutus. Cassius's motives are pretty simple. He hates Caesar because Caesar doesn't like him, and he resents Caesar's power. So his motives are personal, but he knows he can only get away with killing Caesar if he can get enough people to believe that the assassination is for the good of Rome. In order for that to happen, he needs his brother-in-law, Brutus. Brutus is the central figure in the play. He's from an old and famous family, and he has a reputation for being noble. In fact, one of his ancestors, 400 years earlier, was responsible for overthrowing the last king of Rome and founding the Roman Republic in the first place. So it's partly Brutus's family name that's important. With Brutus's help, it's easier for the conspirators to say the assassination was for the good of the Republic. Another reason Cassius needs Brutus is that Caesar loves Brutus. Brutus and Caesar are friends, while Cassius is obviously not Caesar's friend. So if Brutus is the leader, it won't look like he's doing it for personal motives. At the beginning of the play, crowds of people are in the streets celebrating because Caesar has returned from beating his rival, Pompey, in a civil war. Two of the elected officials, Flavius and Morellus, go around driving these people off the streets and removing decorations from the statues. What they say to the people is, look, Caesar didn't come back from conquering a foreign enemy. He just beat Pompey, another Roman leader, so he could be dictator. What's to celebrate about that? Later we find out that Caesar has them removed from office for doing this. Next we see Caesar and his followers on their way to a celebration and a foot race. Whenever we see Caesar, he seems very arrogant. He gives orders to those around him and speaks about himself as if he's invincible. Calpurnia, Caesar's wife, is with him here. So is Mark Antony, Caesar's most loyal supporter. Mark Antony loves games, sports, parties, and drinking. Caesar trusts Mark Antony because he thinks someone like that, who enjoys life, is less likely to threaten him than someone who's always brooding and thinking, like Cassius. Cassius makes Brutus hang back from this crowd so he can try and convince Brutus that a lot of people in Rome think Brutus is just as good as Caesar and wish he would stand up and challenge Caesar's power. This is a lie. Cassius is just trying to manipulate Brutus. Later, Cassius even throws rocks with notes attached through Brutus's window and leaves notes on his chair in the Senate, so Brutus will think multiple people are trying to get him to stand up to Caesar. Brutus agrees to be part of a conspiracy against Caesar, and the rest of the conspirators gather at his house late at night. We can tell two things about Brutus already. One, he's idealistic, and two, he's a fool. A series of dramatic events occurs leading up to the assassination. A soothsayer, or fortune teller, warns Caesar to beware the Ides of March, the day he actually does die. That's March 15th. A massive thunderstorm moves over Rome, with so much lightning it seems to be raining fire. People see a lion in the Capitol building, and others see the lion giving birth. Brutus's wife, Portia, tries to convince him to tell her what he's up to, since she's his wife. He almost does, but gets distracted at the last minute. Calpurnia has a dream in which Caesar is spouting blood from many wounds. She tries to convince him not to go to the Senate that day, and he agrees, but one of the conspirators, Decius, convinces him he'll look weak if he doesn't go. A man named Artemidorus gives Caesar a paper telling him about the plot, but he can't get Caesar to read it. All of these events suggest two different interpretations. The first is that even though all of these things might have stopped the assassination, it's as if there are higher powers that are moving events towards Caesar's murder, meaning its fate. The second interpretation is that Caesar could have avoided being killed. His fate wasn't predetermined. But his arrogance caused him to ignore all these warning signs, so his death was his own fault. 
The way the assassination occurs is that Caesar is on his way to the Senate, together with a crowd of people, including the conspirators, who are going to the Senate too because they're senators. Before they get there, a conspirator named Metellus gets down on his knees and asks Caesar to bring back his brother, whom Caesar banished. Caesar refuses, and Brutus and the others crowd around Caesar and kneel. Then they all stab Caesar, one after the other, starting with a senator named Casca and ending with Brutus. Caesar says, et tu, Brute, meaning you too, Brutus, and then dies. The populace goes wild as the news spreads. Mark Antony first runs away, but then sends a servant to ask if he can safely come and ask them the reasons for the assassination. Cassius and the other conspirators all want to kill Mark Antony too, but Brutus says no, that will seem too violent. Now that Caesar is dead, Mark Antony won't stay loyal to him. This is a big mistake. Mark Antony asks for permission to speak at Caesar's funeral. Again, Cassius and the others say no way, but Brutus says to let him, as long as he doesn't say anything bad about them, and if he's doing it with their permission, nothing can happen. This is another big mistake. Brutus gives a speech explaining that he loved Caesar, but Caesar was ambitious, meaning he wanted to be a king, and so Brutus killed him because he loved Rome more. The populace likes this speech. Then Antony speaks. He says he's not going to criticize the conspirators, but he reminds them how much Caesar did for them, and how he offered Caesar a crown and Caesar refused. Then he shows them Caesar's cloak and all of the holes stabbed through it, pointing out how Caesar loved Brutus and trusted the others who turned on him. He also reads them Caesar's will, in which Caesar left a huge amount of property to the people of Rome. The crowd goes wild and decides to burn the houses of the conspirators. Mob rule ensues, and Brutus and Cassius flee for their lives. Three people take over in Rome, Antony, Julius Caesar's nephew, Octavius, and Lepidus. They raise armies to fight Cassius and Brutus and make lists of people to be killed because they support Brutus. Cassius and Brutus each lead an army as they fight a civil war against Antony, Octavius, and Lepidus. The next time we see them, they are meeting together with their armies, and they get in a big fight in their tent. Brutus criticizes Cassius harshly for taking bribes, and then he criticizes him for not sending Brutus money to pay his own soldiers, because Brutus is too pure to take bribes himself. They eventually make up and become friends again, but once again we can see that Brutus' idealism and poor judgment are big weaknesses. He absolutely needs Cassius to win this war, so it's foolish for him to criticize Cassius the way he does. And he's hypocritical. He needs money too, but he won't do what he needs to do to raise it. Brutus wants them to take their armies to fight Antony and Octavius at Philippi. Cassius points out some flaws in this plan, but Brutus insists. Caesar's ghost appears to Brutus that night, telling Brutus he'll see him at Philippi. The armies meet and have a battle. Antony's army defeats Cassius' army, but Brutus's army defeats Octavius's. Cassius sends his friend, Titinius, to investigate, and he thinks he sees Titinius being captured, even though Titinius actually meets friendly soldiers. But Cassius commits suicide because he thinks he sent his best friend to be captured. The armies fight again, and this time Brutus loses. Before he can be captured, he kills himself by running onto his sword while one of his soldiers, Strato, holds it. When Antony discovers Brutus's body, he says that he was the noblest Roman of all. For more information about Julius Caesar, check out the Julius Caesar Sparknote on sparknotes.com. For a translation of the entire play into modern English, go to No Fear Shakespeare at nfs.sparknotes.com.